My dearly beloved in Christ, I would like today, being the Feast of St. Patrick, to speak about the life of this great saint because many people like to celebrate on St. Patrick's Day or they will wear something green or do something to celebrate and yet not many people are aware of the details of his life beyond maybe the fact, the legends, that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland or... um, something of that nature, a few legends that are known, that are widely known. St. Patrick was born about the year 375 in the western part of Great Britain, either in Wales or Scotland or, or part of England, but on the coast of the Irish Sea opposite the island of Ireland. Now, England was colonized by Rome in the year 45 A.D., Ireland, on the other hand, was never conquered by the Romans. So it was this unknown, forbidding place, and Christianity had not come at all to Ireland by this time, the late 4th century, except in slaves that were carried away to Ireland by the Irish pirates. And that's exactly what happened to Patrick. When he was not quite 16 years old, a raiding party came across, and they nabbed him and a number of other people and took them back to Ireland as slaves. He was there purchased by a man who had uh, large herds and he was assigned to feed the herds and to live out, spending most of his time out in the open, living among the, the pigs and the sheep and cattle and so forth. And it was at this time that Patrick began to regret that he had not lived as a better Catholic in his youth. In fact, he believed that the reason why he was captured was as a punishment for his laxity. And so he began to return very seriously to the practice of his faith, praying continuously throughout the day, doing a great deal of penance, rising before light and He used to genuflect many times and recite many prayers. And indeed, he became quite holy during these six years of exile. And towards the end of those six years, there was a voice that came to him in a dream and told him that he was to travel to the seacoast in the direction of the seacoast, and there he would find a ship that would take him to freedom, that would deliver him from this exile. And that's exactly what happened. And according to the ancient lives of St. Patrick, there were two other short periods of captivity. But after St. Patrick returned from this exile, he decided to pursue a vocation to the priesthood, and he went to live in a monastery in France run by St. Germanus. And he lived there for something like four years. Then he went to another monastery. He traveled around, and he spent at least 20 years living in different monasteries, preparing himself for his mission. And during this time, he kept hearing, like in a dream, the voices of the Irish people saying, Patrick, come back to us and teach us about the true God. Again, up to this point, there had been no missionaries to Ireland. So Patrick believed that was his vocation, but he prepared himself. And he prepared himself, as I said, by years, living in different monasteries, studying, was ordained. And then finally he went to the Pope, and Pope Celestine commissioned him as the Apostle of Ireland, consecrated him a bishop, and sent him there in the year 432. Now, St. Patrick was actually not the first Apostle of Ireland. There was a missionary sent there in 430 or 431 named Palladius, Palladius was a very good man. In fact, he is honored as a saint, St. Palladius, but he had very little success. And maybe the reason was because he didn't know the language. He was from France. He did not know the language and the customs of the people. And finally, he was discouraged. He left Ireland and he went to Scotland and became an apostle of Scotland, Palladius. But St. Patrick went there in 432 and traveled over the course of really the remainder of his life, the length and breadth of the island. One of the the biographies says that he started in the north and went to the south. 
Then he went to the west and went to the east. In other words, he made the form of a cross. But what is amazing is that by the end of his missionary career, literally, the entire island had been converted to Christianity. There were certainly some holdouts of the pagan religion, etc., or individuals who weren't converted, but by and large, the entire nation had been converted. And as you have heard, it became known as the Island of Saints and Scholars because of the effect of St. Patrick's missionary work. And that indicates to us his personal holiness. It is said that St. Patrick prayed the 150 Psalms of David of the Psaltery in the Old Testament every single day. And he divided up the night into three sections. The first part of the night, he prayed the first 100 Psalms. Then the next part of the night, he prayed the remaining 50 Psalms standing in cold water. And then he spent the last third of the night sleeping with a stone for his pillow. So St. Patrick was very penitential, also very prayerful. He would genuflect numerous times. He himself said over a hundred times every day to the honor of God. The story is told about him taking a shamrock, a little plant that grows in Ireland that has three leaves, and teaching the people about the Trinity. So he had a great devotion to the Trinity and again would genuflect to the worship, the honor and glory of God as well as recite many prayers throughout the day. Another thing that St. Patrick did was he would go somewhere every year during Lent to spend 40 days in fasting and solitude. And there are places in Ireland that are reputed to have been places where he spent Lent on a particular year. One of them is a mountain where he spent Lent on the top of that mountain. Another is an island in a lake. And it's quite interesting because they had, they actually still have, but not at all what it used to be, uh, what they called St. Patrick's Purgatory. And that was something for only men who wanted to go there and make a retreat on this island. So you'd go out on a boat, on a ferry to the island, and it was run by religious, and it was a retreat of three days, and the first day would be fasting the entire day. And then they would spend the entire night making a vigil of Eucharistic adoration. They wouldn't go to sleep at all the first night. And there would be sermons, etc., during this time. It was a very penitential, very rigorous uh, penance and retreat on a place where St. Patrick spent Lent one year. And I remember reading about that, and now I'm sure after Vatican II, it's much relaxed. But that was a devotion, and many men wanted to go sometime in their life to that location and make a retreat at St. Patrick's Purgatory, as it was called. And maybe because St. Patrick was so um, disciplined and so penitential himself, maybe that's why there is this, this spirit among Irish monasticism of being more rigorous and more penitential than on continental Europe. So the monks there were very, again, penitential and rigorous. There were literally cities of monks within the two or three hundred years after St. Patrick's life. Because of the effect of his preaching, there were so many vocations of convents and monasteries. And men from Europe, mainland Europe, would actually go to to monasteries in Ireland. So there is a book that was written on how the Irish saved civilization. Because what happened is St. Patrick evangelized Ireland in the latter part of the 5th century. He arrived in 1432 and lived to the late 1400s. And during that time, in the next two centuries, there were these barbarian tribes that would sweep across Europe like the Huns and the Visigoths, etc., and it completely uh, uprooted the way of life of the people in Europe. And these barbarians would come and then they would settle in and take over the lands, etc., So it was a a time of great flux where there was not uh, a stability in the rest of Europe. But the Irish monks were copying the texts of scripture and the other books and were keeping alive the faith. And also uh, monks would go as missionaries back to Europe. There are a number of Irish monks who went to Europe. Now, 
when we think about St. Patrick, some of you may be thinking, well, I'm not of Irish descent, so maybe it doesn't mean as much to me as it would mean to someone else to honor St. Patrick on his feast day. But I would venture to say that every single one of us has been affected by this one man because in the early part of the United States, most of the clergy of our country were Irish. There were so many priests in Ireland that they would go to other countries. And of course, all of that ultimately goes back to St. Patrick. So it is his holiness that led to the conversion of that country and to the subsequent missionary works. When I read about St. Patrick, and I, I like this book called The Most Ancient Lives of St. Patrick, which has the, the earliest lives that were written. And it also has in there, and I'll read a little section of it, his own writing. There are two writings of St. Patrick that we have that we learn about his life. But when you read about it, you read how penitential we, he was, how prayerful he was, and it reminds me of the Curie of Ars. If you read the life of St. John Rivieni, when he went to Ars, before all of the people began coming for confessions, and he would spend hours in the confessional. But early on, when he went there, very few of his parishioners even went to Mass on Sunday. And he literally lived in the church. And he was praying and doing penance for the conversion of his parish. And not only was his parish converted, but again, people came from far and wide to go to confession to the Curie of ours. But it goes back to his penitential and prayerful life for the conversion of his parish. And the same thing you see in the life of St. Patrick, how he was so penitential and, uh, and again, spent so much time in prayer for the conversion of the Irish people. Now, the work that is called, a, like a letter, that he wrote called The Confession of St. Patrick was written towards the end of his life because he was being attacked by some clergy in Britain. And really, ultimately, it went back to jealousy. He was so successful and they wanted to encroach upon his work and his territory. So he had to write a defense of what he was doing, etc. And he starts off, I, Patrick, a sinner, the rudest and least of all the faithful, and most contemptible to very many, had for my father Calpurnius a deacon, the son of Potitus, a priest, who lived in Banaven Tabernier, for he had a small country house close by, where I was taken captive when I was nearly 16 years of age. I knew not the true God, and I was brought captive to Ireland with many thousand men as we deserved. Now when he says, I knew not the true God, it was not that he was utterly ignorant. He was a baptized Catholic. But he is saying, I wasn't living my faith as I should have. So what really comes out to me when I read his confession, and it, this is throughout the work, is his humility. He constantly speaks about how unworthy he was. So he says, I was brought captive to Ireland with many thousand men as we deserved. For we had forsaken God and had not kept his commandments and were disobedient to our priests who admonished us for our salvation. And the Lord brought down upon us the anger of his spirit and scattered us among many nations, even to the ends of the earth, where now my littleness may be seen among strangers. And there the Lord showed me my unbelief, and at length, that at length I might remember my iniquities and strengthen my whole heart towards the Lord my God, who looked down upon my humiliation and had pity upon my youth and ignorance, and kept me before I knew him and before I had wisdom or could distinguish between good and evil, and strengthened and comforted me as a father would his son. And it just goes on like this, a, a beautiful writing explaining his life, and he goes into, into the historical details of his life, but it shows that he had this tremendous humility and this conviction that he was nothing and could do nothing. And when you read about the great Catholic missionaries that went to different places and accomplished a great deal, the more humble they were, the more they realized that it was only the grace of God that would work conversions, the more success they had. So they brought about conversions because they depended entirely on God and had a tremendous humility, and they practiced penance and a great deal of prayer 
for the conversions of those to whom they preached. St. Patrick worked many miracles. He raised numerous persons from the dead. And it's fascinating, again, to read the uh, ancient lives that were written of St. Patrick. But on this day, as we celebrate his feast, let us particularly pray to St. Patrick for a love of the faith. He was so strongly rooted in the doctrines of the faith. He wrote the beautiful prayer called the Breastplate of St. Patrick, and again, preached the faith so successfully because he had it in his heart so firmly rooted. And let us pray also for the spread of the faith and for the conversion of all of those who are separated from the true faith. May St. Patrick assist us to persevere in our faith and lead others to the truth. St. Patrick, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.